So if the justification is that you can't oh, prove that's true. it, they just be like, then... "Oh, it was uh, Aztec soda." <laughs> <laughs> Aztec soda? What is that? <laughs> it's this. This is Aztec soda. <laughs> All right. This is where the podcast begins. What's up, everyone? We got some Aztec soda here. All right. We got Aztec soda. The Peruan soda. You know what? I the, don't know. I can't be dishonest, though. We're not dishonest. Aztec, Aztec soda? soda? Yeah. All right. Anomasa is drinking Aztec soda. I'm drinking Modelo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna be dishonest there no. No, because think of like think of it in the in the most philosophical sense. Like uh beer is one of the first things that was brewed since like caveman times. There's recipes for beer. I'm trying to get closer just so the video actually so, like, comes out. Like Mexicans are descendants of the Aztec Empire. In in in, in Well you said Mexicans are descendants of the Aztec Empire? Yeah. Is, isn't oh, it, yeah, isn't they're, it they're the indigenous and... people from Mexico, right? Or they're one of the indigenous people. Yes. Because there's also the Toltec tribe. There's oh, there's also... a whole bunch. Yeah. Cahuilla. But the, but the Mayans are the ones that are most well known by by people because they've made movies about it. I'm sure they're well known. I don't know who's the most well known. But what I'm like trying to say Aztecs is that, are. But the Aztecs, you know, they brewed alcohol as well. You know, oh, I guess to be fair, I don't know if they had carbonation. I don't know how they would have done it back then. You know how I heard they made... Because I, I think beer was made by accident. Really? Inadvertently, yeah. I think I think people had been transferring whatever ingredients are within alcohol. And it just so happened that they were in a boat for an extended period of time. And then when they got to their destination, they were like, oh shit. Like this thing actually tastes good and it has this effect. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of cool inventions that came about inadvertently. <laughs> Without someone's conscious effort, it just so happened to come to fruition, and then people find out the benefit, and then you market it, and then now it's known as beer, or it's known as, I don't know, it's something else that kind of randomly came to fruition. There's a lot of things. I can't think of them off the top of my head, but like potato chips. You ever heard that story? Was that an accident? Yeah, it was a, some, I don't know where it happened, but it was like some king that wanted potatoes, but every time the cook would make them potatoes like he wouldn't like them because they were too thick so he just like he was actually I guess being he was trying to be like not sarcastic but like he was trying to like he was trying to be annoying so he cut them extra thin the king? Uh, the the chef okay he cut them like extra thin to be to, to bug the king yeah to be like you want them thinner? fine I'll make them super thin uh... but then he actually ended up liking them but what did he do once he cut them really thin? Did he well, bake them or yeah, he, he fried them or something like that? And the and so the they came out looking like like potato chips, but like really old potato chips. But the king liked them, and then they just became a thing like chips. So that means originally what he was doing was fried potato, but it wasn't a chip. It was just like a fried potato ball. Yeah, but like really really thin. No no, but originally I'm asking, mm. he made the dish for the king, and it was a potato cut so it was almost like a potato wedge what was the original Maybe. dish that he was making for the king for the king to then say I don't say? know the full story I just know the potato that, chips that's what I'm interested in yeah. I know the potato chips it was like he just cut them extra thin accident. fried them just to fuck with them and uh, or like to spite them like you know what I'm gonna make these as a joke I'm gonna make them super thin but then the king actually ended up loving them and then now we have potato chips hundreds of years later I feel like that's probably the way we have a lot of things but no one talks about the history of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of things are probably by mistake. And to try to find out where exactly was the origin, I feel like it's something also that's very difficult because there could be a lot of different variations of something very similar. Mm. But who was the oh, first one to do yeah. it? Well, it's not so much who was the first one to do it, but who's the first one to actually have it recorded that they did it? Because think about how much shit back in the day would happen but there was no way to actually prove that it happened because there was not social media. Yeah, there's no like people. Huge... Yeah, people weren't always uh, documenting everything. Mm-hmm. So maybe people were making fucking potato chips at some other part of the world, but no one ever fucking knew. Yeah, there's no like database for international database for what's going on all the for time. New discoveries, yeah. Like now, well, you just at least have not to our knowledge. Yeah, now I mean, we... if we create a time machine or some shit, <laughs> and then we if can we go back. If we created a time and... machine and we went back in time like a hundred years ago. And just started talking shit like, 
there's computers, there's phones, and they're like, what's a phone? And it's like, you could call someone from around the world. How do you do that? Like, I wouldn't be able to explain to them how to make an iPhone and how to set up antennas. I wouldn't even be able to explain to them how electricity works. I'd just be like, put a key at the end of a kite in, in a thunderstorm, just fly it, and you'll get electrocuted. <laughs> like, <laughs> Although, before I lose this thought, I want to say, because I yeah. think it's kind of kind of nice see the way we would document the entire history of the human race would be first off we develop a time machine and then we get a fuck ton of drones or however many we needed to actually be able to get a 360 visual of the entire planet mm -hmm. and then we send a bunch of drones all throughout history so we go as far back in time that the time machine allows us and then from there like maybe every like five ten years a different group of drones different group of drones different group of drones until the point that we get to basically present time and all those drones are documenting every little inch of earth including underwater and then now we have some type of artificial intelligence that could then analyze and categorize every activity that's ever taken place and then now we would know exactly everything that's ever happened on planet earth but first we'd have to have a time machine and have drones that would have the capacity to be able to go around the earth and literally record everything from sound to visuals to detecting power and having different detectors. Obviously, that's kind of an obnoxious idea, but <laughs> but why not think about it? Because yeah. that's how big things come to fruition is by someone having an idea and then having the willingness to actually execute on it. But first off, someone had to have had the idea and even had the courage to talk about it. Yes, yes. And I think Elon Musk is one of those characters right now. At least from my knowledge, it seems like. Flying cars into space. Cars? Is that what he wants to fly into space? He wants to, I think he wants to go to Mars. But um, I'm not exactly sure what he wants to do. Well, I know he wants he's, to. He's investing stuff into, uh, into people finding out about the outer space, which generally I'm kind of on board with. But Generally? So where does is, where is that... Why isn't a full why isn't it a full commitment versus generally? Um Well, he's not he's not like a government. He's just an individual. Mm. So there's no allegiance necessarily to any given nation. It's just Elon Musk is doing it on his own accord. Which, from an individualist standpoint, is great because it's like, wow, you know, you're doing all this on your own, you're funding it and all that. But from another end, it's like, man, that's a lot of power for one person to have. But at the same time, this is space. This is the final frontier. This is what we should be investing a lot more money into. You know, we should be learning about all these other planets and comets and we? asteroids. Because. Isn't that what we do? We just search and we 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 explore. I, I mean, think, think we're think, curious think, I mean, people. Yeah, I mean think of think of Lewis and Clark, right? The Oregon Trail. Finding the West Coast. Finding other planets, finding other forms of life. The Oregon Trail? Yeah, the Oregon Trail, the Lewis and Clark expedition, they they set out to, to find Oregon. And where did they start from? Like from the East Coast, and then they went from the East Coast all the way to Oregon, something like that. Or maybe they started in Missouri. I don't. I don't, know. I don't remember exactly. Bottom line, you're talking that the humans have always had this. Yes. Bottom line is they've always we've always had this desire to explore. To explore the same way we discovered America. Or you could say Christopher Columbus, but apparently there was people before him that had actually discovered America. Yeah, there was indigenous people. According to my dad. Here. Yeah. Well, there was already indigenous people that lived here, and then, so he didn't really discover anything. He sort of, maybe you could say he rediscovered, but um, yeah, Christopher Columbus was a bad guy. To say He's the a least. bad guy, He's to say the least. Why do you say that? Well, there's there's records, there's there's journals and sources of evidence that just claim them. Well, like. The people that he killed, the people that he violated, the people that he Oh, so you're talking mainly the indigenous people. The in yeah. I don't, hopefully I'm using the correct term, but Indians? Is that what you call them? Well, that's what he called them, but um, I think probably just... Indigenous in people. Just indigenous people. They just, they were here He killed before. a lot of them. He killed 
damn near all of them, like ninety nine percent of them. All of them from what location? Every location that he visited. Basically, every location that he visited. Because from my understanding, he actually went to the island Hispaniola. Mm. That's the first island that he landed on, which I think Hispaniola is considered North America or a part of the Americas. Hispaniola like the for Carib- people. Like the Caribbean islands? Yeah, people who oh. don't know, the island of Hispaniola is the island which includes the Dominican Republic and it includes Haiti. Oh, According to my dad, because my dad's from the Dominican Republic, yeah. he says that that's the first place that... It, Columbus actually landed mm. with the Dominican Republic and then he eventually came to the land South America North America but he first got to that island and um a bad dude man bad dude but there's that's a, just looking at a, him from one perspective well there's though. accounts of him uh grabbing babies by the ankles and just slamming their fucking skulls into the rocks Grabbing babies' ankles and slamming their skulls against yeah, the rock? just to kill them. And this is documented? Yes. But how is it documented? Like primary sources. People write documents. But what's the primary source? I can't give it to you off the top of my head. But I can find it and I can give it to you after No, no, no. But I'm saying like what would define something as a primary source? Like a somebody journal, that I was there? A journal that somebody writes. So somebody, somebody that was there. Or a, story that's, or a story that's passed down generation through generation through like certified storytellers of a tribe. Oh, so this story, these... I don't know. I don't know exactly which one of those was how it was passed down, but I know like if you read Howard Zinn, a, a People's Voice, you'll get a lot of information. That's about, a book. Yeah, Howard Zinn. A That's pe- an author. A, a, yeah, Howard Zinn, a People's Voice of America, or something like that. I forgot what the exact title is. Okay, but the people who documented that Christopher Columbus was grabbing babies by the ankle and then banging their head on the on a rock or on the ground. This was documented by the indigenous people or it was documented by one of Christopher Columbus's fellow comrades? Christopher Columbus's comrades. So why would he document that if it would kind of make because, his group look bad? Because you don't think that it's going to make your group look bad. You just look at it so, like, yeah, that's what so we did. So this guy was Fuck a journalist. Indians. This guy was there purposely with Columbus. I don't know he was a journalist. It was probably just his, shol- his, his soldiers. Yeah, but a like motherfucker you write, doesn't... Like, you write stuff in your diary, you don't think anyone's going to read it. You just write oh, it. Oh, so you said he, this guy just had a diary. He wasn't, like, a particular Probably. person assigned I, to journal the whole experience. Yeah, I, I can't be there and say that this is why they did it, you know? But, but you I know remember, that somebody documented it. Yeah, That's like, as much as you know. Yeah, like, I remember reading... It was a U.S. It was a U.S. History 101 class at San Bernardino Valley. And we're learning about all these things, the way that Native Americans were treated... And for once, we're getting the pers- the other perspective, not like the high school perspective where like, oh, Indians lived here and they made a deal with the white people and then the white people expanded and, you know, the Indians just let them. And like the whole time, it's like they're not Indians. Like... Because that's what they called them, right? Yeah, because these idiots actually thought they landed in India. Yeah, that's right. So they yeah, call them Indians. They, the, the, the Europeans called them Indians because they thought they landed in India. Because in India. they were looking for a spice trade. Uh, mm-hmm. A new route to to trade spices with with Asia, and no, but I think I think when Christopher Columbus landed at Hispaniola, I think they were actually looking for this new world. I don't think that was for the spices. Mm. Well, but don't take this yeah, too th- literal because I'm I don't think either of us are the most educated upon this. Definitely but. not. Take it with a grain of salt. Well, I'm I'm a physical education specialist. And <laughs> <laughs> He's a nutrition specialist, but um, we're talking about all these other things that are just interesting. And they're yeah. just intriguing in nature. Like, um, it is one of the next books that I want to read. Like, I just finished the nutrition book right now, so I'm super excited. And I just love, I love nutrition. Just reading about it. But the next few things that I want to read are uh, the philosophy book. That's the longest philosophy. The one book. I let you borrow. Yes, the one you let me borrow. And I think someone gave that shit to me. So it was now Marcos. Just Marcos didn't want it back. He let me borrow it? It was him or Devin. Um, it was him or Devin. They took a uh, U.S. Philosophy 101 and then just like fucking... All right, so, for, oh, so it was Devin's, then it became Marcos's, and then it became mine. Something like that, yeah. Okay, so for people listening, me and Armacio were roommates at one point for an extended period of time, about four years. Yeah. And we went to Cal Poly Pomona, and then now we're talking about a book that Armacio wants to start reading that yes. I gave to him, but that book was given to me by a roommate that yeah. was given to that roommate by another roommate. Books are like the best... <laughs> Books are like the best present you could give someone. Well, someone who really cares about knowledge, someone who actually reads, like just like let them borrow or give them one of your books, and it's just yeah. phenomenal, dude. Like if and you, you never know. Like even if it's somebody who doesn't ordinarily read a book, like mm-hmm. that book might be the thing to trigger them to start reading. Yeah. 
But reading's awesome because, like, how many times have you, like, had a question about something and just you never answered it? It just stays in the back of your head. And then you're reading something and you're like, oh, my God, this is that thing. This is that thing that I was thinking about. This is that information that I've been searching for for so long. And then you read it and this author and these series of authors, they just end up articulating your idea so perfectly. And it's like for me, I can say I can say it's been relieving because so many times I can't tell you that I've actually felt like maybe I'm just crazy. Maybe I'm just maybe I don't know what I'm talking about and I'm just spouting out nonsense. But then I'll read something in a nutrition book or in a sociology book or some other book. And all of a sudden this author's articulating an idea that I thought. I was like coming up with like maybe I'm just reaching for something that's not there and then lo and behold it is there it's actually well documented it's and there's a level of deep research and yeah. deeper understanding than you had ever actually come up with yeah and then I just feel like wow <laughs> I thought I was the only one like no dude, this been, this thing's been searched already there's already books on it and it just I don't know I guess it validates some of the questions that I have and some of the thoughts that I have you know and I feel like it probably inspires you to keep digging further and keep just being yourself. Because yeah. you're like, oh, shit, there's other people who are interested in the same exact thing. And these people were so interested to the point that they got to this depth of understanding yeah. of it. Yeah, I mean, people literally invested decades of their life into studying this phenomenon, hmm. right? Like, this is interesting, you know? And even like the nutrition book I just finished, it's, it was published in 2006. That was 15 years ago, right? 15 years in nutrition. There's a lot of stuff that people know now. There's a lot more people know now from then. But that book still has really good basic knowledge. Um, and it's not like something that was published in there is going to be completely wrong today. It's just that there's going to be a lot more reference now than from then. See, but the interesting thing about nutrition is that it seems like every day, well, probably similar similar to a lot of other fields, but nutrition, there keeps being deeper and deeper levels of understanding, mm. as if there was no limit to how much we could learn. Because mm. now in the last, I think, 10 years is when we really started digging deeper into the microbiome, the different bacteria mm. within our gut and what type of significance that has on our health. And like this is a whole new branch of nutrition that if you went back 30 years in the past, we didn't really know anything. Mm -hmm. I think even if you only went like 15 years in the past, there was barely anything. And we're just scratching the surface to understand what kind of influence the bacteria in our gut has. To the point that if you didn't know or other people didn't know, like there's certain surgeries that people can have nowadays where you actually input other people's fecal matter or shit into their GI tract or their intestines up the rep uh, rectum right their anus yeah you just put it up their butt yeah I, I don't even know how they go about the process I think I've seen like one video but they pe they put other people's shit inside of you so that you could get the benefits of their shit the bacteria that they have in their shit so that just goes to show the kind of impact that the bacteria can have if this whole thing has actually become marketable and people are seriously doing it. And I don't want to speak too much on it because I, I genuinely don't know that much knowledge about it. But I think there is some type of significant results that are coming about from those kind of surgeries. Because I don't think we would have talked about it in my nutrition classes if it didn't have some kind of impact. Yeah. From what I've heard about it, it's like people who have really unhealthy bacteria and it causes like all these digestion issues and like leaky gut. and uh, Un uh, Imbalance. And a slew of other health complications, they get like the, or even for babies, right? To get to get them to grow healthy bacteria in their gut because they're they're relatively new to all this stuff. Like you just take the healthy uh, feces of one human being, and you just insert them up the rectum of the unhealthy human being, and it'll even affect their palate, so that they start craving healthier foods just by the bacteria in your gut that's that is that is wild <laughs> you know it's fascinating but there was there was nothing about that in the in this book hmm. it was 2006 nothing about the microbiome nothing about that the probably microbiome. proves what i'm talking about or yeah. illustrates what i'm talking about yeah i can remember 
I really can't remember anything. I don't even think they talked about probiotics mm. in this book. So that's what I'm saying. I mean, when they talked about vitamin D, they didn't talk about any role that it plays in in, in the immune system. There was zero, not so, a single. So what did they share about vitamin D? Because I think <laughs> for anybody who may yeah. tune into this, I think right now a conversation regarding vitamin D would be insightful because yeah. everyone wants to have a good immune system. So what did you learn about vitamin D? Well, from this book? Yeah, from that book. From this book, all it said was that vitamin D uh, helps your body absorb calcium, um, which together can help you to form stronger bones. Mm-hmm. Uh, it mentioned that vitamin D is like the sunshine vitamin, so you can get it from being exposed to like sunlight for a certain amount of time. Maybe even if you don't want to actually go outside, just like sit by your window, right, and you get some sunlight. It didn't really mention like how high the sunlight has to actually be to produce vitamin D. I had to look that up on my own. Like the UV rays, uh, the, the, what I read online was like the UV rays have to be at least like a three rating or higher for your body to be stimulated, your skin to be stimulated to produce vitamin D. So what does a three rating look like for a practical purpose? Well, right purposes? now in the winter time, it's basically like being outdoors at noon. For California, you're for talking California. about? For Southern California, um, it's... Being outdoors in what's we're in January, but even December and November, because after the the um, the time shift, uh, being outdoors somewhere between ten o'clock in the morning and like one thirty, two o'clock in the afternoon, that's when the sun's rays are at their most powerful. Mm. But because it's winter time and like our you know, the sun's out for a shorter period of time. The sun's out for a shorter period of time, and the also distance, like distance, right? The distance of the sun. Well, the the globe is tilted the opposite direction because now we're in winter. Mm. So the sun's rays are like weaker mm. or, or we, the sun's rays aren't weaker. We just receive less of mm. that UV, uh, of the UV because of the position that we're in relative to the sun. Yeah. We receive weaker UV rays. So it's harder to get vitamin D in the winter time in Southern California. Um, and now, now in, in the, in the summertime, at 10 in the morning, the sun's rays are already like at 4 or 5. <laughs> in the middle of the day, it's at 11. So, yeah, in the in, in summertime... It's almost like any time of the day. Yeah, any time of the day, you're going to have more than enough vitamin D. You actually need to wear sunscreen so that you don't get you know sunburns and stuff like that. In the wintertime, it's going to be really hard for you to get a sunburn. You don't need to wear sunscreen in the wintertime in mm-hmm. Southern California. But uh, other ways you can get vitamin D are like eating fish, you know, salmon, tilapia... Uh, eggs have some vitamin D in them, but for the most part, you could also get them from like milks. Milks are usually very well fortified. Um, and that was about it. That's all it kind of mentioned, but it didn't mention anything about the immune system. Okay. So just to recap real quick, the benefits so far that we've talked about for vitamin D would be that vitamin D consumption, adequate amount allows for maximum calcium absorption, which would promote for healthy bone structure. Which would also help us prevent, to some extent, symptoms of osteoarthritis. All Oste- of the- osteoporosis? Osteoporosis, oh, yes. I was like, wait, that sounds like, As soon as I said I was like, wait, not, I'm not osteoarthritis. <laughs> osteoporosis. Basically, weak bones. Yeah, weak, brittle bones breaking down because calcium deficiencies are really hard to measure. As we were kind of talking about this on the phone while ago. Calcium deficiencies are hard to measure because when the when the... Calcium in your blood decreases past its homeostatic point. In the bones release some of their calcium into the blood. So then, you know. The calcium could be transferred to where it needs to be. Yeah. But all the while, your bones You're are losing, losing calcium. losing the integrity or the strength of the bones. Yeah. Unless, like you were saying, like you specifically test for a specific marker that's released when calcium is being extracted is being extracted from your bones it's going to be really difficult to know if you need more calcium but most people if you're not drinking milk every day or if you're not taking some type of calcium or vitamin d supplement uh are susceptible to being deficient and just not knowing other than hey my bones break pretty frequently you know um yeah, or you, it could, I think for children who don't get sufficient of vitamin D and calcium, they might they may not just grow to their optimal level. They might not they may not grow to the height 
that they could have if they were consuming an adequate amount of calcium and vitamin D. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure I'm sure calcium and vitamin D play even more roles than just the integrity of your bone, but that's probably the the most significant thing. Yeah. So what did you learn about the immune system with regard to vitamin D? Uh, well, nothing from this book. But this just book in just, general. In general, now just from posts, like I follow Dr. Mark Hyman. Uh, he's like from the like he he's kind of like this food is medicine type of belief, and he always posts stuff like vitamin D for whatever reason it plays a role in your immune systems. Okay, I, before we go further, what's this guy's credential? Um, well, he's he's got a PhD. <laughs> and PhD in what? Uh, some form of nutrition. I don't, I I can't name the credentials off the back of my hand, but he's there. If I look it up on my phone, I'll I'll be able to find it. You can look it up if you want. Look, oh shit! Okay, let's oh okay, let's let's see what. Let's see, Doctor Mark. We don't got a Jamie out here, so we we do the oh, research ourselves. Okay, let's see. So let's go to Instagram. Ooh, I hope he's not a quack. <laughs> he doesn't seem like a quack. He seems like a pretty good dude. Um. Mark, I feel like um, a lot of the things that I've been doing during doing during this podcast, like kind of making had, sure to. It says he has an MD, but you were saying he has a what? He has an MD. MD but and it, what? But it doesn't say in what. Because MD that stands for what? Medical degree. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, see, they... I don't know what it is. Uh, thirteen times New York, thirteen times, uh, New York Times bestselling author, family physician. Oh, he's a physician. He's a doctor. Yeah, but what's his credential? Well, he's an MD. That is his credential. He's a family physician. Like, you know, Mm. when you get sick, you go to the doctor and they give you some drugs to feel better. Well, he tackles his approach is via functional medicine. Mm. I guess for him, it's it's more about it's not about giving you this drug and you're going to feel better now. It's what are you eating Right, we need to switch out what you're eating because that's what's making you sick, or at the very least, it's what's making you prone to get sick. Like what 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 we're eating is causing us to be prone to metabolic diseases, and then that's sort of a uh, snowball effect into all these other diseases like arthritis and obesity and diabetes and atherosclerosis and hypertension and COVID, uh, and you know, all these other diseases, but. His approach is, yeah, just functional medicine. And like. so basically vitamin D plays a role in our immune system. According That's what him. this guy is. Yeah, I'm very strong. And role. don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm asking these questions not to deny it because I'm confident also that vitamin D does play a role in the immune system because I've heard that and heard that a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally just, I don't recall exactly what role it plays in, in the immune system. But well, bottom line, for all you motherfuckers listening, <laughs> you consume some vitamin D, it's going to help your immune system in some shape or form. Yes. You can Google that. Yeah. I think there's a lot of research to back it. I, no, t- like We talked about this earlier too. Like Studies are really long to read, and they're not, like, there's, there's, they're, they're, not written, they're not written in layman's terms. They're written with all these long-ass definitions and long-ass jargon. words. Jargon, basically. And, like, I'm investing time into this and like researching it because of like my own interests Interest, yeah. right it's piqued my interests um, but like I remember reading on like some dot govs and even the CDC's released some research where not as like a cause and effect but like 90% of people that were passing away of COVID uh, had a vitamin D deficiency and where folks who were getting or receiving vitamin D supplementation, the death rate decreased by from something from like sixty five percent to like forty five percent. And this is for just receiving a vitamin D pill for anybody, um, in spite of what their age might be. Like the lack of vitamin D would make anybody, in spite of their age, more susceptible to have negative effects from COVID. Oh well, yeah, I mean if it plays a role in your immune system. Then it would affect it would then it's gonna affect okay. yeah. But vitamin D is something that's just so simple to get. You just drink milk. If you, if you're lactose intolerant, you can drink oat milk, you can drink soy milk, almond milk, rice milk, hemp milk. I mean, you know, you name it. Most of those milks are fortified with calcium and vitamin D. And you know, if you're drinking one or two cups of milk a day, you're getting 
like two thirds of your calcium and vitamin D just from there. If you eat cereal, that's another way, you know, those are well fortified with a bunch of vitamins and minerals. You're getting 25, 10% per serving, which most, I mean, when you eat a bowl of cereal, I don't, how many people actually measure out three quarters of a, of a cup of cereal? You have like two, three servings of it. So boom, you're getting 45 to 75% of whatever the vitamins are. And that's minerals. not including the vitamin D you would probably get from the milk that and, you're consuming. And that's not even including the vitamin D you get from the milk. Well, a matter of fact, most labels actually do say with milk or without. So they kind of do the work for you. But the ones, when it says with milk, I feel like... How do you know what kind of milk I'm drinking? Yeah, they're saying skim milk. I don't know who drinks... Are they? Yeah, like who drinks like skim milk? Like 0% fat milk? I don't, even, I don't even know what skim milk is, but I don't I use skim, skim milk. I think skim milk is 0% fat. Yeah, but it always seems like the nutrients are the same. The only thing that changes is like a little more calcium, a little more vitamin D. But like when you actually drink oat milk or soy milk or, you know, hemp or rice milk, like there's more, there's a lot more nutrients. They're, mm. they're a lot more fortified than just regular dairy milk. Dairy milk has calcium, vitamin D, I think like 10% protein, vitamin bro. A. Can't and a lot forget of protein. the protein. Yeah, but soy milk also has protein. But not when it comes to oat milk or almond milk, usually. Oh yeah, no, not soy milk and almond That's milk. the thing I would tell I'm to milk. most people just real quick is like, if you're planning to go on a plant-based diet, vegan, vegetarian, like be conscious of the protein that you're consuming. There's a lot of things that you should be conscious about, but that's a pretty good one to be conscious about because you can eat, you can get adequate amount of protein from plant-based products, but you have to be conscious because most plant-based sources don't have a complete amino acid profile. You consume a tortilla, it likely has some of your essential amino acids, but not all of them. You consume a tortilla with black beans, you probably got the complete amino acid profile because the tortilla has some of the essential amino acids, then the beans have some of the essential amino acids. So you complement your different food groups if you are intending to go on a plant-based diet. And also, when you buy your milk, like Anamasio said, soy milk does have a good amount of protein, almost the same as dairy milk but if you were to get almond milk or oat milk or oat milk or you know it's different other plant-based alternatives that don't have that much protein it's like one gram yeah. so that's always been my concern with getting like almond milk based milks and then expecting to replace my dairy milk with that because I'm, I'm always sure I'm eating breakfast some cereal with almond milk but I'm getting like what two, three grams of protein. Yeah, like you'd have to be conscious about that. That's pretty much it. Yeah, definitely. But beans and rice. <laughs> <laughs> beans and rice. Beans and rice, complete amino acid profile, right? Yeah. And if you're vegetarian, it's I think a lot easier because the big one is just cheese. Cheese has a lot of protein. It has calcium, and I mean beans, cheese, and rice, bro. Enough have said. you been tempted to go vegetarian or vegan? Well, we tried to go vegan in college. We? You, me, and I don't know. I did go vegan. Yeah. I don't think you I don't think you did it with me though. I did it for like a week. Did you really? Like a week or two. And then I was like, yeah, this is just Did you watch the that one that one documentary with me? Yeah. Well we is also it saw Cowspiracy? Cowspiracy. That's what it was called, right? Yeah, but we also saw was the another one was just about corn and GMOs. Hmm. But, yeah, man, at the end of the day, man, we're human beings, and we need to eat meat. Or I need to eat meat. I need to have chicken, pork, <laughs> turkey. I'm an I'm a omnivore, right? I eat plants. I eat meat. Sorry. You know? Not sorry. Yeah. And I, gotta, I gotta eat meat. It's just, it's so easy to get malnourished when you're not eating meat. Well, my thing, and when you're, when you're trying to avoid every single animal product. Yeah, my thing is when people want to flip a 180. It's like I've been eating meat three times a day for my whole life. And then I watch a documentary or I watch a few things and I get inspired. And then I want to flip a 180. Mm -hmm. When you flip a 180, there's some consequences that you can go through. And it's likely that you're not going to be able to sustain that lifestyle unless you go... I mean, it's likely that you can go through a lot of mental anxiety and a lot of shock. Mm -hmm. Because first off, if you flip a 180 and you actually start to consume a lot of fruits and vegetables and a lot of fiber, 
your intestines are not even prepared to digest that much fiber because if you haven't if if you've been ordinarily consuming only 10 grams of fiber for the last few years let's say the majority of your life and then all of a sudden you're consuming 40 to 50 grams of fiber your body takes time to adjust to something like that you're gonna feel bloated you're gonna feel discomfort it's going to take time to adjust to that and you're gonna feel really uncomfortable and because of that discomfort you're likely to be discouraged to want to continue or you're just gonna have to live through hell for an extended period of time and why not just be more gentle about that process mm -hmm. and make it so that it's likely to be more of a lifestyle change and not let me flip a 180 because I've been emotionally inspired to to start giving a hundred percent fucks about not eating a single cow when I, I've been eating cows my whole fucking life you know like give a fuck but give a buff give a fuck about yourself too yeah give a fuck about your body as well yeah yeah and I you know I tried to do it I saw that thing you were a very a very big driving force for me to try to go vegan <laughs> back then you and Ozzy and this is what uh, this is 2016 for people to have more context yeah. so it's about four or five years ago but i just felt weak man i was like fuck this is really hard to not get a nutrients you can't have cheese can't have chicken can't have fucking <laughs> anything that makes food taste good it's like 80 percent of your diet so yeah so i mean but i also like i do care about the environment and i know that mm -hmm. like eating cows isn't the best thing for us as a planet but you know what i'll club those chickens over the head and you know <laughs> I eat chicken and I eat turkey and that's that's already a pretty big step forward. I mean, chickens waste what like twenty less than twenty five percent of the area and of the grain of the energy that it takes to raise cows and chickens don't release methane, right? Yeah, I think that I think to raise a chicken it requires less resources than to to raise a cow. And yeah. I think per ounce per of, of chicken, yeah. per ounce of beef, the amount of energy that it requires to make that product. It's a lot more energy. Oh, yeah. And it's not necessarily more nutritious. Yes. But don't get me wrong. Red meat is actually very nutritious. Yeah. And there's Every certain things that it has that chicken does not have. Yeah. So I don't buy red meat, you know, but if I go over to someone's place and they're cooking red meat, I'll eat it. Um, but I just don't make it a point to go out and buy red meat. I make it a point to go out and buy like farmed fish so that there's less mercury. Um, it's more sustainable. Uh, and I buy chicken and I try to get the chickens that are like without antibiotics and all that stuff I'm sure that maybe they're still raised with cruelty. I'm sorry chickens. I got to eat you You make my food my food taste good. You're the center of every dish <laughs> Eggs, you know, I try to get like the free-range chicken eggs when I can um, I try to buy local like from Norco farms Norco is I mean, what's like 30 minutes away from here? Um, Real quick, a point that I want to make. I know I just said about like being gentle with the process and about how it might be better to not flip a 180. Mm -hmm. But whoever might be listening also for you, Anamasio. Honestly, at the end of the day, I say execute on whatever is your inspiration. So if you want to flip a 180, like fucking do it. Because mm -hmm. I think my whole thing... Is like just execute on what you feel like doing because then that empowers you because you made a decision because you felt like doing it. Mm -hmm. And regardless of the consequences, you can learn a lot and you can empower yourself. I fucking basically flipped a 180 with the whole vegan diet because I literally went from not being vegan to basically being vegan. And I learned a lot. Now I could reflect on those three months and I learned a lot. And it was intense and it was it was a lot of change having to go to family houses and I don't eat any, eat I don't eat me anymore and people making fun of me and people telling me oh what do you listen to the veggie tales soundtrack <laughs> <laughs> like shit like that i got a lot of shit for it but i learned a lot in a fairly brief amount of time yeah. but i for people listening i was only vegan for about two to three months because then i realized that being vegan was actually it was causing too much anxiety too much i didn't want to give up being able to have cultural experiences of having certain dishes that included me you know i have family in mexico and i got a lot of stuff like that so but in that two or three months now i can reflect upon it and i got a lot of wisdom for it so for anybody listening i would say just execute on whatever the fuck you want to do even if it does mean flipping to 180 but i'm just throwing that grain of salt from the whole being more gentle about it yeah you yeah, know for me it's like dude i need to eat cheese 
<laughs> I love pizza. And I'm just like, I'm not giving up cheese. Never. Nope. Unless the world somehow got extinct of cheese. Well, then then it wouldn't be me giving up cheese. I'd just That's be like... True. That's true. That's true. But of my own volition, I ain't ever giving up cheese, bro. Fuck that. I'll eat the healthy cheese. The You know, I'll eat like mozzarella. It has like pretty low saturated fat compared to like cheddar, jalapeno, jal- uh, jalapeno jack. Jalapeno jack, you know? All right. What if this hypothetical became a reality and someone came out with some research that... For whatever reason, all the cheese being produced from now on is going to significantly shorten your lifespan. Would you still continue to eat cheese? That's a hypothetical. We'll figure it out. I know, when we but get let's there. just say hypothetically. We'll figure it out when we get there. I'm never gonna get there. I don't oh think... well, then, then then it's not even a good question. I right, fuck you then. <laughs> <laughs> That's a dumb question to ask. Uh, uh, but look, at the end of the day, nutrition. It's a journey. You learn more about it throughout life. You learn what works for your body. You learn about allergies in your food or food sensitivities. And you just adjust, you know? This is the PE teacher of Anamasio coming up. But cooking, dude, cooking is so much fun. Like, you're, it's artistic and it's creative and you're just mixing things together. Like the eggs that I made this morning, you know? It's really simple ingredients. Some extra virgin olive oil cooked on low, medium. That's the secret for making really good food is cook it on low or medium. And then just throw the eggs in there. And while they're in there, you just mix them up a little bit. You don't have to scramble them in a bowl and make more dirty dishes. And then you just chop some bell peppers, some spinach, and what's the other thing? Onions? Mm-hmm. That was it. A little bit of salt. Put some ketchup and tapatio on it once it's ready. Oh, and the corn tortillas. And corn tortillas, and that's it. It's bomb. See, it was bomb. I'm here to say that. Simple ingredients. You just cook it right and... It's delicious. High quality protein too from those eggs. Oh yeah, high quality protein, omega threes from the olive oil, mm-hmm. extra virgin olive oil. You got fiber, a little bit of fiber, not too much, but some fiber from the bell pepper and spinach, spinach and onion. And because I only threw in the bell peppers at the very end, the vitamin C isn't like broken down mm-hmm. and it's still very vibrant and colorful. So then you look at that and you're like, wow, this food is vibrant. It's like it's like alive, you know. This is good stuff. You know, and the spinach, you just throw it in at the end and it shrivels up, you know, but that's... The onion was the only thing you threw in towards the beginning, right? No, everything that I threw in at the end. Huh. So oh, was, well, once the eggs were pretty much cooked. Once the yeah. eggs were pretty much cooked, that's... And that's usually how I cook. I usually throw the vegetables in at the very end. They just kind of brighten up a little bit and then you're ready to eat. But that also does depend on the type of vegetable. Because if yeah. you had carrots... Like, for instance, if yeah. you're making a soup and you're making carrots in there, you yeah, no. probably want to throw that shit in yeah. for a couple hours. Carrots and, carrots and potatoes. Broccoli is one of those things that you could have it either way. You could throw it in the microwave for, like, two minutes, and then they're just, like, perfectly bright green, and you just dip them in hummus. And that is just a phenomenal combination. Let's keep talking. Yeah. Broccoli, carrots... You throw them in the microwave for a few minutes. They get real nice. They still retain that little bit of a crunch. But then you, like, hummus, dude. Hummus makes so many things so good. It's just a good spread. You can make freaking burgers. I mean, so I'll, 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 I'll tell you what. Um, or if you're going to go down, yeah, then sure. But hummus, I mean, you could even, I've put it on, like, hot dogs before. You know, you toast the hot dog buns, you put a little bit of mayonnaise on one side, a little bit of hummus on the other side, and then, you know, you, you put your, your your frank on there, maybe drop some onion, a little bits of tomato. Um, I don't know if you want to go with a little bit of, like, pickles, chopped pickles. What is it, relish? And you just put it all together, and you got a bomb hot dog, you know, or sliders, Hummus is really good spread. Is that a bottle opener? Yes, sir, it is. So whenever you drink, we drink with education. <laughs> Let people know what you're talking about. Oh, I, just, I tell my dad, look, you know, whenever I drink, I drink with education. It's the Cal Poly logo. <laughs> so I'm like, I drink with education. with room temperature? Yeah, I mean, that's... The way that beer was intended to be drank. As according Eamon would, to Eamon. As Eamon would say. Eamon's are one of our roommates from the past. He was very knowledgeable about spirits and... Spirits, really? Yeah, like, well, like alcohol in general. 
Oh, I thought you meant like human spirits. I was like, what? <laughs> he was very in tune with his avatar. <laughs> For people listening to the audio, in these last like 30 seconds to a minute and a half, I went downstairs and got a couple more drinks because the inspiration hit. Why are you giving me this? What do you mean, why this is the room temperature one. Oh, why did you give me the room temperature one? Because I asked you, are you okay with it? <laughs> why did you give it? That's fine. It's fine. If you're not, then just tell no, me. No, no, can... I don't. I don't mind drinking uh, Aztec soda at any uh, at any right. given temperature. Aztec soda. <laughs> oh, that's where this uh, the whole thing started with Aztec soda. Um. Uh, oh, dude, you got a new shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I changed my shirt too For the people listening To only audio Um But yeah We just left on nutrition You were talking about hummus I heard you Yes hummus It just It's a good spread To put on Toasted bread Really good spread Yeah Well hummus is basically Made out of garbanzo beans But hummus could also be Made out of a lot of Different stuff Cause I feel like hummus Is almost like It's almost like a consistency Cause I know there's Different types of hummus Like black bean hummus well, it seems like the main ingredient in making hummus would be some type of legume. But I think traditionally garbanzo beans are the ones that are used for traditional hummus. The one that I like is made from hum- from garbanzos. And oh, then yeah. it's it's like cayenne pepper in the center. Cayenne pepper or roasted red pepper or uh, even uh, like pine nut, roasted pine nuts. Oh, yeah. This is they're just so good, man. I, fi- I could... I have finished before an entire one of those little discs by myself, like in one sitting. I just, I had a whole broccoli crown. Wait, wait, wait. You had a whole thing of fucking hummus? Yeah. How many ounces? Uh, like the fucking thick one like that? Or was it like the kind of thinner one? Was uh, it like it the regular the hummus size or was it like the kind of double size? It's probably the regular size. Oh, okay. But like, goddamn, still it a just, lot. It, yeah, that's still a lot. And one sitting, it, oh, I'll tell you what. I remember it's ten servings. Damn. It was just, it just probably like a good six, seven hundred calories. Then it smacked, dude. or maybe less. It than was, that. it know. was good. And I had a whole crown of broccoli. I chopped so it. So it was just broccoli with hummus, dude. It was so good. This was back at the apartment. No, this is back well with my sister's place. Oh shit! And so this is recently kind yeah, of. Yeah, this is this is probably two, three months ago. Oh shit! And I had carrots as well, but the carrots were just raw. Hmm. So I'll go like broccoli, broccoli, carrot, carrot, broccoli, carrot, broccoli, broccoli, oh, wait, carrot, the broccoli carrot, was carrot. completely raw? No, I cooked it for like, I threw it in the microwave for like two, three minutes. Okay, did you put water with it? And like a, a little steamed, bit of water. Like a steamed paper towel? No, like I wet? put, um, I put like, um, it's like glass with the top on it. What are they, I don't know what they're called. What are they called? I don't know. It's like a It's not the glad thing that goes in the microwave To cover the food Yeah like you know When you want to take your food out You go to work You take it in a glass container Oh Tupperware Tupperware <laughs> <laughs> I put it in Tupperware I put it in there But I didn't like Actually close the Tupperware I just put the lid on So that way there wasn't oh, Like any pressure that I would build you. And then when I open it It just pops I just put it loosely On top to cover it Put a little bit of water And then just You know Cooked it for two or three minutes And then You can just tell By the color that it has Like oh that, that's That's perfect but is that tup- is most Tupperware is it BPA free or is it safe to put in the microwave? <laughs> Glasses. It should yeah, gla- be. Oh, but oh, the one you're talking about was made out of glass. It was glass. Oh, uh, so that one should be fine. <sighs> um, but yeah, dude, I finished the whole thing of hummus in one sitting. I left like this tiny little bit, maybe like enough for like another broccoli bit. And what were the consequences? Did the bathroom session go well? Yeah, eventually. Whenever it hit, I'm sure like <laughs> eventually three days later. Yeah, like I don't remember my bowel movements. I just when you have you really not. Well, no, when you have them. So how often I mean, do I you had, go? I had one earlier today. <laughs> how often do you go? Uh, probably once a day, once every other day. Damn, bro! Like to not go a whole day without taking a shit. That shit just sounds wild. Like the thing is, I, I go, know people on most who, days I go. I just sometimes I go two or three times in a day. But on average, you'd say on average probably once a day. And is that morning or evening? Uh, usually like midday. Hmm. Usually midday. So what about back when you were midday running? To the evening. Back when we had seven a.m. practice. For whatever reason, if we had a speed workout, it was like right before the workout. 
Cause that's that's that that like that was me before. Like was, I always take a shit in the morning, yeah. especially if I know I'm gonna work out. But just in general, I usually take a shit in the morning. Cause like I have a pretty hefty dinner, and then like obviously by the time I wake up, like everything's been digested. But usually when I wake up, I'll drink tea or I'll drink water, and then that helps to like activate my system. And then within an hour, two hours of me being awake, like I'm gonna go take a shit. Yeah, for me. Well, at that time, that was very consistent, like, running schedules every morning. After, like, that warm-up, I felt like I would need to go. Like, two, three-mile warm-up? You know, two, three-mile warm-up, and I'd be, like, stretching. I'd be like, I don't know, I feel like I gotta, you know, gotta go. So, you know, that's when I would I'd probably go at, le- at least a few times a week. Oh, I thought you were going to say a few times before the workout. I was like, damn, what the fuck? No, just at least a few times a week that would happen where I'd be like, damn, I got it's another speed workout. I got to go to the restroom real quick. Do you remember that I was always like the last guy on the line when it came to speed workouts because I'd be in the bathroom? Oh, really? You, remember, you don't remember that? Maybe we went to the, we just went at different times. But you don't remember that? Like on speed workout days, I'm always the last motherfucker you guys are waiting for because I was in the bathroom. <laughs> you don't remember like, that? I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. No, I was like legit. I, I'd always go to try to evacuate, like last minute, like try to make myself as light as possible. But yeah. which was kind of some bullshit because I was just like me overthinking about it. Yeah, I would just honestly just feel it. Like I felt that warm up and I'd be stretching. I'd feel like, oh, I feel like I gotta go. After I do like a few strides, like man, I gotta go. <laughs> so I just do another stride over to the restroom. Be like, you guys finish up strides. I I gotta go real quick. And then come back and like and I'm come good. back and then coach just, is about to break it down. Like <laughs> fuck, you know. Just what? miss out on the whole fucking strides. Yeah. And just be like, what are we doing? Thousands. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, jump in. You know, that's all you need to know. How, what are we doing? Thousands. Cool. Go. Boom. Ah, dude. This I shit. Th- just wanna... thinking about running makes me so fucking happy, honestly. And especially yeah. thinking about running at college. Like, fuck. It was fun. It was fun running laps on that little dude, field. Dude, workouts are like the fucking best. I feel like it's the best. Workouts are definitely... Now that I look at it, like workouts are definitely a lot funner than doing the regular runs. The regular runs, I'd be like, I'm just tired and sore and just want to get this over with. Well, the workouts, the workouts now, I'm like, damn, that sounds Feels nice. crazy. Let's huh? do some thousands. Let's go fast. Feels good to go fast. No, but for me, there was those, it's like a pro and a con. But for me, it was almost everything was pros when it came to running because I just loved it so much. I love it so much. But it was like regular days, you run with the group. When you go on a 12, 13, 14, 8 mile run, like you get to fucking talk and you tell stories and people will make up fake stories and talk about it the whole fucking, the whole one hour, two hours. And like you just have fucking fun. But for people listening, like, like me and Anamasi were avid runners. So like we would be, you know, we would run like 50, 60, 70, 80, up to 90 miles per week. And we ran long distance for like, I did it. Uh, consistently for about eight nine years straight Anamasio did it since he was like a little kid up until his 20s and so like when you go for a long distance run like you're talking you know not all the time but most often if you meet a group of long distance runners like they go on runs and they talk as if they were just walking because that's really what you do and um and you get a lot of funny moments you get a lot of stupid shit a lot of jokes a lot of a lot of fun memories but when it comes to workouts that's when everybody kind of like you get serious you know people get serious but that's another excitement because it's like okay we've been putting in all this work now it's like you get to see it and you get to feel the fitness that you have because like i think coach west would say he said all the long runs that you do is basically for this is for the workout to help you for the workout so I always felt like all those long runs though they would get me tired for the workout. <laughs> well, you're probably much. doing too much for yourself. You yeah, know? I really, I really wish I would have been able to try like maybe like 65 to 70 miles a week. I feel like that would have worked a lot better. But yeah. the the joy is now like okay, well I live that experience, and now that I'm coaching, um, I can make sure that I emphasize more quality than just quantity. Because you can only train as hard as you recover. And I feel like I definitely did, tr- like, my sleeping habits got better throughout college. But I don't know. At a certain point, the only way 
like my, my my last year i was actually sleeping like a good seven and a half to eight and a half hours pretty consistently i remember times i'd even go to sleep like at 10 i'd wake up at six in the morning i'd wake up early my body was just like i feel good and um but what i'm trying to say is like i've learned a lot of what works for me and what doesn't work for mm-hmm. me and i also saw for a lot of other people what works for them and what doesn't work for them and you know like the sad thing is like i've only had one season a season and a half with my athletes like one full cross country season and like maybe actually maybe like a third of a track season <laughs> Adam Osteo is a high school coach cross country yeah and and <laughs> but like we didn't even get to run one track race and uh, but we had a little time trial in the rain and a lot of athletes they basically they ran their PRs from the previous season but it was just like a time trial in the rain and they were in trainers and they ran their PRs from the previous season. So I think it would have been a really great season. I mean, even just what they did in cross country, they... Guys so you're were, saying it was sad because COVID hit, right? When yeah, and things I, seemed to be... Yeah, and I wasn't able up. to... And I mean, it's not even just me. It's, I mean, coaches all over the place. Everyone's sad that, you know, they didn't have that legendary track season. Some people still continue to train on their own, you know. Um, unfortunately, you know, I was just a substitute teacher at that time and a, and a coach. I didn't have, like... If I would have done that, I I don't know that I'd be here right now. You know, if you would have done what? Risk like practicing with a few kids during COVID. Uh, you know, and then even so, like it's just you're saying you don't know if you'd be here right now. You mean, like, if I would have gotten busted for it or something. Uh, okay. And even now, like, yeah, I'm tempted to have practice anyways, but it's just, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not fully safe. You know, and. I would much rather my kids and their families be alive and that I don't contribute to infection rates than just, you know, have practice anyways. It's like, dude, all the signs are there. All the health warnings are there. Like it's a pandemic. You're doing virtual teaching. And some people just like, yeah, we're just going to keep practicing. Oh, well. And I get that because kids, kids want to be with other kids and they want to run and they want to talk. But, um, just didn't feel right for you. It just doesn't feel right for me to do that, you know, to risk so many people's lives. Mm-mm. Hmm. Um, but when we do come back, yeah. we're fucking shit up. Well, like you know, six days, Ooh. six days a week practice, you know. Ooh. And I do want to cut practices a little shorter. I usually practice for like three hours. That's like the limit per day, and I go the full amount. But I feel like we could, I could cut that down to like two hours or two hours and fifteen minutes. Because at the end of the day, I also want these kids to be able to like go home and do stuff. Just because I have three hours as a max, I don't want to keep them there for three hours, you know. And I want to be able to, like I said, just give quality. That's it. Quality know? love. Yeah. Quality but, love. Yes. But I also like to like I don't know. I I talk a lot, and I like to teach them a lot of things about life, and like more than just you're not. Like yes, you're here to run, but like if you're not applying these principles to your life. What are you doing here? Yeah, because well, like I, you really have to contemplate that. Yeah, because like I I need to teach them about like it for me when I was growing up and well even now I'm still growing up but especially in my adolescence like I always asked a lot of questions because I didn't feel like the coaches that I had were necessarily the most knowledgeable or I or maybe I just didn't understand why they were having me do certain things when I felt that wait wouldn't it work better if we did this and. So now I guess I still have that in my head. So now when I teach students something, they're naturally curious. So I'm like, okay, well, this is why. And I take the time to explain it to them. And, you know, to, you know, sometimes I drag it out a little too long. I'll talk for like 10, 15 minutes about a concept or an idea. But like... Can I, you hurry hurry it up, Coach Cardenas? We're yes. getting kind of fucking bored. Yeah, I got to go. You know, I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta, but this is important. This is important stuff. You need to know how mitochondria works. You need to know why the long run is good for you. You need to learn why I'm doing all this stuff for you. So that way... You're talking about the mitochondria to your cross-country athletes? Yeah. Well, what if those motherfuckers aren't interested? Then who are you talking to? Well, You're then, talking to yourself. I'm. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build rapport and trust so that when I tell you run this amount, you don't go, oh, why do I have to run that much? I'm like, we just went over it. Yeah, but I feel like you have to connect with them because if you're yeah. not connected, then who are you really providing service to yourself? No, we... I think in cross in in cross country season that was like my first season, and there was a whole lot of challenges, 
to say the least, there was a lot of challenges that the team was facing from just a constant change in coaching staff. And uh, so I had a lot of those challenges to overcome. I feel like when I got to cross to track and field, I wasn't even trying to recruit any more distance athletes. I was trying to get field athletes and throwing athletes. Yeah, well, those are field athletes and sprinters and hurdlers. But I just kept getting more distance runners. And I was like, I don't want any more distance runners. So I feel like I really did kind of, I feel like the connection was there. And we started kind of being a team, even though I was out there by myself with 80 students. You know, and I'm the only coach out there. Yeah, and when I say connection, I mean just like in that particular instance, like if you're communicating with your athletes, with your students, like if what you're saying is not any, sl like if what you're saying is not actually capturing the eyes and the ears of the audience that you're talking to, then it's like, and especially if you're in the position where you're the coach. You know, for instance, this podcast, like, I'm just a fucking host. I'm not necessarily guiding anybody, so, you know. But, like, what I'm trying to say is, like, connecting with the audience so that you could inspire them to move in some direction. But for that, you have to be very, you have to be, you have to be into your feelings and understand, like, is this shit connecting or is it not? Like, can I look up at their faces and the kids are looking at me? Or am I looking at their faces and everyone's just kind of like this or everyone's like this or everyone's just on the fucking phone? Well, that's another thing, too, is like certain people who were already there for a few years, they were kind of more like the annoyed side. Like, why do I need to know this? <laughs> Coach yeah. again? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> my, my Can side. I just go run? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But people who were like freshmen and who were new to the sport, they were the ones that were like, Oh, they were oh. intrigued as fuck. So then, why not just let the kids who aren't interested go, and then you? Because talk how many? How often does? It, because that's not part of being a team. Part of being a team is that you all need to learn this, mm. and you need to check your attitude, and you need to stay together mm. in spite of. <laughs> yeah, you or know? you might think you know something, and you're at, and and we're like, we're putting up this facade, and we're putting this thing like I don't need to learn this. I already know better. I've been running for a few years, but like, no, you don't know better because you were never taught this, and I can tell. Ooh. You know, so you have a bad attitude, but that's what you need to work on is your Ooh. bad attitude. You're you're showing up to practice, although you're not showing up to practice every day, but you're showing up to practice pretty routinely. And yeah, you might be a varsity athlete, but guess what? One of these freshmen or sophomores is willing to learn and is willing to get better. And it's only a matter of time until they catch you. And that did happen. That did happen where some freshmen beat some um, some people who were varsity at the last minute and you know we swapped them in and they performed the freshmen performed right and that's the thing it's like it doesn't matter how good you are if you ever get comfortable and think i've learned all there is to learn and you become uncoachable and you don't trust the process you don't trust your coaches you're not going to progress anymore and that's kind of the essence of what i was trying to teach and the thing is too is like it's my first year right True. so the first year there's a lot that you don't know me, right? You don't know me in this light. So I need to introduce myself. I need to let you know what I know. I need to let you know how I know it. And without taking too much time, um, and see how people respond and see how people respond. And also like give them the choice. I would give them the choice. Like, okay, today we're going to talk about three things, but we'll talk about it in whatever order you want. Do you guys want to talk about divorce? Do you want to talk about mitochondria or do you want to talk about, I'd have some other topic. And they'd be like, what? Let's talk about divorce. Not neat. So they'd be like, how is divorce going to make us a better team? So then I'd talk about like, well, look, you know, there's a doctor, John, uh, John Gottman of the Gottman Institute. He can predict with like 90% certainty whether a newly married couple will divorce within like two years time or within the year's time. And he was able to predict with 90% certainty. So how was he able to do this? So I talk about the four, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the four things that'll that'll end any relationship, right? And there was four of those like stonewalling, which is where you're refusing to answer someone's question. There's like where you're you're flipping the criticism on them. Um and the final one, the, the big one that I emphasized on was like contempt or disrespect. When you don't respect someone, the relationship is over. Now why is that important Wait, in what was the first one? Stonewalling? What is that? 
stonewalling is just where you kind of refusing to answer the question and you're you're putting up a front you're stonewalling hmm. um there was others but the other a lot of them were manageable the one that was like if you have you can have three and you can still come back from it but you have this one it's 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 like a it's like a nail in the coffin and that was contempt or disrespect for people right when you start when you stop respecting people that relationship is over now why are we talking about divorce and love in a cross country team well because you're a team you should love each other right and if you disrespect each other if you're sarcastic with each other that's not how adults talk to each other and that's not how a relationship lasts that's how a relationship crumbles right you need to respect each other and based off of what i saw as as the challenges of the team i figured this is something that's great to talk about you know and like i said you know a divorce obviously none of you are married in a, in an intimate way like like a marriage but you know you should think of yourself as having a relationship a platonic relationship with your teammates with your male teammates and with your female teammates and you should love each other in in that sense right that you care for each other you want the best for each other you want the team to improve you're a unit and you respect each other and that's going to show because when you love each other you're more likely to show up to practice you're less likely to to flake you know you're more likely to hang in them hang with them that last mile when you feel like giving up if that's someone that you love right if every every person on the team is your best friend every person on this team is your family you're willing to work harder for them and in turn that's going to make you more successful as a team so those are the things that i try to teach them and it was just like wow and so those these are things that are, they're not just going to affect you while you're on the team i mean these are principles that are going to affect you when you're talking to your mom when you're talking to your dad your brother your sister cousins aunt uncles friends this is like for the rest of your life you understand like oh you're teaching them philosophy that could be applicable and that you see suits the needs that they have that your team need that your team has but also our principles that could help them in their everyday in their day-to-day -day life because yeah, how you do anything is how you do anything when no one is looking is how you'll do everything mm. while you're on say that again how you do anything when no one is looking is how you'll do everything later on listen to that shit folks fucking wisdom dog say that shit one more time i'm being fucking serious because i think that's the way we have to, that we have to get that a point across that's my version of that quote i don't know how the actual quote that goes, shit's fucking dope say but it again it's just how you do anything when no one is looking is eventually how you'll do everything later on Fuck, dude, that's just fucking deep, you know? and it's so fucking true. So that's, and the thing is, like, it's not enough to just say it once, and then okay, the students learned it because I said it. No, like this is important, so we're gonna drill it, drill it into you. So I'm gonna repeat it, maybe not every day, but every week. You know, I'll repeat it because it's that important. You know, the stuff that's important, you don't just gloss over it once, and you're like, I know it, I'm good. Right? No, you do it every day. You don't just do one podcast and just, oh, yeah, it's good. No, you, before we started, we set up everything. We have a process. We follow it every time. And, you know, all those things are important to learn because um, they just make you a better athlete. They make you a better person, you know. I think of, I think of Bill Bowerman uh, from, like, the movie Without Limits. And that's, Steve Prefontaine movie, right? Yeah, Steve Prefontaine, one of the three Prefontaine movies. And I think of that scene where, where he shows up and uh, Pre's there, and Pre Pre's obviously his like, fucking star athlete, right? World class, and uh, and Pre asks, and whether this really happened or not, I don't know, but we just assume. Moral of the story. Moral of the story, yeah. Pre goes, hey, why does Bowerman call a meeting for seven twenty-seven? What's wrong with seven thirty? Bowerman goes. Hold on. I'll explain it. If I call a meeting at 727, it promotes the question, why 727? And everyone shows up at 727 to find out why. Oh. It's like, holy cow. Damn. But that's, that's so true. Because how many kids are like, oh, the meeting's at 730? I'll show up at 735. Damn. I'll show up at 732. But like, no, the meeting's at 727. Why is it at 727? What the hell is going on? So you show up oh. and that's a part of life showing up and being punctual, right? That's your word. But also the other scene that shows up 
is at the end of that spe- at the end of that speech he'll go running one might say is basically an absurd pastime upon which to be exhausting ourselves but if you could find meaning in the type of running you need to do to stay on this team chances are you'll find meaning in that other absurd pastime life damn and, and like I imagine that that's how he really was because that's how the movie portrays him. Whether he said those exact words is beside the point. The point being that, like, Bill Bowerman was a amazing coach. I mean, he coached national champions in track and field in 15 out of 19 events. Talk about depth and breadth of specialties, right? So I'm sure he didn't know how to throw a good javelin or 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 even the the hammer. I'm sure he wasn't an expert at every single one of those things. You know, I I, I think he probably had some philosophy that he was instilling in his athletes to get them to understand. Like, men of Oregon, I invite you to become students of your events. And then he was some running. Some might say is basically an absurd pastime, et cetera, et cetera. But he'll start off with, I invite you to become a student of your inve- of your event, right? Don't just show up to practice, get your run in, and go home and think you've done all you need to do. Go home, look up videos. How do the best of the best take off? And it's not to say become obsessive about what you do, but be a student. Mm. Be a student. Be willing to learn. Don't think that you've ever learned it all. Because, again, mm. from our other podcast, when you... When you stop learning, you die. Right? You just plateau and you stay the same. It's not it's not conducive to being a a better athlete. Right? Because when you get to college, you're not running 5K anymore. You're running 8K. Or you're running 10K. Right? And after college, well, you just got to keep learning if you make it that far. So, so that's what I was trying to do. And... What I love about cross country is that the results are not relative. The results are absolute. It's one of the few sports where the where the besides like swimming or maybe biking, where it's absolute. Like any other sport, it's all relative because you're only as good as the teams that you beat that year, right? And you can say, well, they have these stats. Well, yeah, well, you have those stats, but those stats were played against other people, right? You measure yourself against other people with running. You measure yourself. You could measure yourself by other people. But also, your time stands on its own. That's an absolute metric for how fast you've ran, right? If you run a four-flat mile, you ran a four-flat mile. It don't matter that you came eighth in the race. You ran a four-flat mile. That's fast, right? We can all agree that a four-flat mile is fast. Um, Even courses that are hilly, you could say, well, this is the data for the last 10 years, and you ran this time on this course, right? That's a really fast time on this course, for cross country versus if you run another course that's flatter it's like okay this is a flat course your time is faster on this course obviously but like you can compare and there's a history of things that you can compare against um and the time on a course is that time on a course so i love that i was able to like look up their past times and just re- compare like look this is what you ran last year on this course you ran this exact same course this year look how much faster you are mm-hmm. look how much faster you are look how much faster you are from last week from two weeks ago, from three weeks ago. So I was able to keep like a spreadsheet and just update it as I went along. And I was able to see which athletes were progressing and which weren't. And athletes that didn't perform well, I could put a little note like, oh, you know, maybe they fell on the back hill, right? They fell down and they're injured. And then in the future, when I come back and look at it, I can tell, man, this kid was showing a lot of promise. What happened? Oh, they fell at this race, right? They fell down a hill and they were injured for a few weeks. Context. Context, exactly. And then other athletes that I feel like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, this kid's missing practice. You know, th- it's no wonder this kid's not improving. Um, or maybe this kid wasn't here all summer. So that's, you know, maybe that's why they didn't improve as much as they would like to. So all these things, it, I guess, yeah, it just provides context and, and memory for why they perform the way they perform. And at the end of the year, being able to look at where they started and where they finished and to see some students like, man, when they started, they were at 30 minutes and now they're at 18. Like, holy cow, it's huge. You know, or students who started off at 25 minutes and now they're at 19. And just, there was definitely a lot of hope and 
of like let's see what these kids can do in track let's see what they can do next cross country season and obviously COVID COVID will end eventually and you know we'll just restart the process you start back from square one get the basics and you know some of these students that were freshmen I won't see them again physically till they're juniors but we just restart the process and you know that's that's part of the fun it's going back to going back to square zero I don't know that we'll have to go actually back to square zero exactly but it is going to be a lot of restarting a lot of more recruiting stuff like that but it'll be fun it's always fun because it's not just about like how they perform either it's also how did you feel about how you performed right because sometimes kids PR by 10 seconds and they still feel sad and it's like okay look you've got uh, the challenge for you is like you don't believe you're good enough even though you just ran 20 seconds faster you still don't think you're good enough and you are you know maybe you'd like to be faster I understand that I always want to be faster too but it's progress you're faster than last week just keep working hard and you're going to be fine you're going to keep progressing you know uh, versus other kids who are just like yeah, I think that's that's yeah. when you get into the mentality where you're more concerned about the product than you are about the process yeah. and that's where that illness comes around because ultimately like you said you're always going to want to get faster or you always can get faster or just to be more generalized just with life like you can always get better like always even when you're 60 70 80 maybe you're not getting better physically because physically your body's now going down but in terms of wisdom in terms of experience in terms of a lot of things you can always get better obviously once you have literally like dementia or your mind is not functioning then you could say that i guess you're going more downhill but yeah, that's why I love to talk about and I love to emphasize the enjoyment of the process because it's always going to be processed. There's never going to be an accolade that just fills you with so much happiness that for the next 30 years of your life, you're just going to be happy because of that one accolade. So it's like, just enjoy the process of it. And I guess I'm honestly feeling tired and I want to wrap this up. So I'll just ask you my last question, which I feel like you already kind of gave like a really awesome thing, but just just to ask it and because i've been asking this question since like the beginning of the podcast and i like to do it um right now 2021 what's the day today martin luther king jr day is mar is, is march uh so it's january 18th 2021 6 31 p.m what's your message for the human race assuming that everybody in the world could understand your message what would be your message for the entire human race. And feel free to take your time because I know, I don't know, whatever, it doesn't matter how long you take. I know last time I said keep learning. <laughs> but, uh, um, I just feel like it's still relevant. It's just keep learning. It's it's not. Don't confuse that with never be satisfied, because I feel like I was taught that in college and I wrestled with it for a little bit, where it was like don't don't ever be satisfied because once you become complacent, you're dead. But I don't think that's an issue being complacent. I mean, just how many freaking people in our culture? If everyone is special, how can everybody be special? It's just baloney. Not everyone can be, uh, I mean, yes, everyone has the ability to be special and all that jazz, but how special are you when you're just trying to be special? Mm. You, you know? So for that sake, I would just say, look, just, it's okay to be happy. It's okay to be complacent. It's okay to be happy where you are, but just keep reading stuff. Just keep learning stuff for the sake of learning not to necessarily get to a new level. I mean, if you want to, that's great. But just keep learning for the sake of learning. For the sake of, I don't know, just being introduced to new things. For the sake of maintaining an open mind. For the sake of, I don't know, what is that, perspective? For the sake of, for, for its own sake. You know, you don't always, 
it's like do you wait until you get sick to start doing the right things or do you you know get ahead of the game and you start reading about your health and then you're like oh whoa wow i can prevent a lot of these diseases or maybe i already have a condition and by learning more about it you can manage it better right like learn Fuck. for the sake of learning don't ever stop learning I, I never started recording <laughs> Alright folks Well that was the whole podcast Ugh. I hope you enjoyed it Thank you so much Anamasio uh, Much love to everybody <laughs>